Welcome. Uh, those of you who have been here before know that it's a happy, it used to be called the Human Rights Happy Hour, so um, part of the idea is to have food out here and give you a chance to chat with the folks around you. Um, so uh, I look like that happened a little bit and um, invite other folks to come and join in along the way. Um, today is the beginning of a semester-long colloquium on labor inequality and human rights. Um, some of you know that quite well, uh, specifically the 14 students in the class who are mostly sitting at these two tables, but I see you're spread out a little bit. Um, and uh, we've been meeting since the beginning of the semester, for those of you who aren't in the class, um, and have been exploring different aspects of labor inequality and human rights, uh, but um, this is our chance to get into the heart of it with a series of speakers who will be coming. Um, we read their work the week before they come, and then they come and talk about it, and then we go talk about it again. So um, we get a lot of exposure to it. Um, I want to recognize Kate Taylor here, um, who the students know. Uh, she's our new postgraduate fellow at the Rappaport Center and working on a project on labor inequality and human rights with us for the next couple of years, um, and has been helping out a lot with the seminar and the speaker series. Um, and uh, we really appreciate that. Um, so today, as I said, is the first of actually six speakers who are coming, and there's a list of them um, back there, at least with five of them on there here. So this is every Monday from four to six, every other Monday from four to six. Um, starting uh, today, we will have talks on different aspects of labor and human rights. Um, also on October 19th, which is a Thursday, Ai Jin Poo will be here, um, who has been, is a, a very well-known labor activist mainly, um, is known for her work around organizing domestic workers. Um, she's also been working a lot with the folks who work on aging and care more generally, and she'll be talking about um, care workers and a variety of aspects around her work um, and hoping to spark some organization in the community here. Um, she will be the third annual um, speaker for the Sissy Farenthold um, Endowed Lecture in Peace Social Justice and Human Rights, and Sissy Farenthold will be here as well, um, so it should be a great event. Um, today we have Brishan Rogers, um, who has come to us from Temple University um, in Philadelphia. Um, and Brishan researches and writes on international and transnational labor law, technology and the future of work, race citizenship and labor regimes, and law and economic inequality. <laughs> Um, and I will say that before he went to law school even, he was a community and labor organizer, and I hope that some of that, certainly it shows in the work, but I hope he'll talk about it a little bit today, and then he also practiced as a lawyer um, before going into academia. Now, the title of the, his talk today is Rethinking the Future of Work, Law, Technology, and Economic Citizenship. Um, it's the title of a book that he's working on and agreed to come do something a little bit unusual for us. So originally, so Brishan's a great guy, as you'll see, and originally he was going to be our final speaker and we were going to end with the future of work and he was going to give us part of his book. Um, but I talked him into coming early um, because of work that he's done on global value chains um, and on the global sweatshop problem and I thought it would be a great just introduction um, to the series. So what he did was he gave us a couple of papers to read um, in the seminar, um, and one was entitled Law and the Global Sweatshop Problem, mm -hmm. and the other was a provocative piece he wrote on universal basic income um, in the Boston Review, um, and both of those are published and available if you're not in the class and you're interested, um, we're happy to, to uh, veer you toward them if you can't find them. Um, and what he agreed to do today was to tie them together in a way that will offer us a bit of a snapshot of the book. Um, so. Brishan's gonna speak for 30 to 40 minutes, and then we're going to have about a 10 minute response from our own Joey Fishkin, um, a colleague here at the law school. Um, among other things, he works on employment law, voting rights, and distributive justice. Um, he has a 2014 book entitled Bottlenecks, A New Theory of Equal Opportunity, 
and he's working on a new book with Willie Forbath, who is also here. Um, and I, we noticed that you each have different titles on your on your website. Um, so we're going to go with um, Joey's title, I think, which is the anti-oligarchy constitution, but you might want to look into that. Um, all right, so with no further ado, um, help me welcome Christian. Thank you, Karen. Uh, and um, I'm really, really happy to be here. Uh, and um, I want to thank off the bat, uh, in addition to Karen, Kate, Sarah, uh, Dan, and Joey, of course, uh, and the Rappaport Center generally for hosting me here. Um, the, uh, so as Karen said, this is, um, I'm working on a book length project uh, that takes up all these questions in, uh, in a fair amount of detail. Um, it's going to try to do a couple of things, um, and the talk that I'll, you know, w what I want to do today is give um, sort of some of the highlights of that research and argument. Um, I may end up not saying all that much about basic income, uh, but I'm, you know, sort of happy to dig into that in much more detail in the Q and A. Um, the book is really motivated by two major questions. Uh, the first is. What's the relationship among law, technology, and economic inequality today? Um, and you know, three things I want to talk about today are the you know the history of greater and greater fissuring of production, meaning the splitting of production away from vertically integrated firms into contractual chains at both the domestic and the global level. Um, the more recent. Uh, you know, purported threat of automation, which is, you know, being trumpeted by Silicon Valley and a good number of people in policy circles as something we have to keep our eyes on. Um, I actually tend to think it's a bit overblown or a lot overblown and uh, that some of the more acute challenges to workers that are stemming from technological innovation uh, are actually rooted in other uses of technology to manage them in particular ways. Um, and the second, uh, you know, the second part of the book is, you know, what can we do about economic inequality today, uh, in particular as it relates to work, which is, of course, you know, the main way that most people still get the majority of their resources. Um, and I'll have a couple suggestions on that front as well that really respond to the increased incidence <laughs> of fissuring um, and try to think about uh, new types of collective bargaining structures that are more appropriate to the sorts of production regimes that we have today um, and, and more generous welfare and social insurance regimes. Basic income is obviously a piece of that, though as I said, I won't say that much. Let me give just a tiny bit more context before I start. I want the, bush, the book to push back against a couple of uh, major trends in public debate right now, some of which are already being reflected in academic debate or have been for a while. Um, you know, the first is the view that economic inequality is largely a result of technological development, uh, which is, um, you know, I'm developing that in the current work. You see it in public debates, you see it in uh, books such as the, uh, you know, the Fourth Industrial Revolution, the race between education and technology, uh, the whole literature on skill bias, technological change. I'll, you know, I can say a bit more about all of that later on, but just to give you some markers. That's the first. The second is a widespread view that labor and employment law, and particularly unions, don't have much of a role to play in addressing these questions. Um, and that's something that Willie and I actually took up in a piece in the New York Times last month, uh, you know, arguing for new types of collective bargaining regimes. And then the final, you know, the, the default position uh, embraced by a good number of people in policy debates and then, you know, by more and more people in legal academic debates, or, or some people in legal academic debates, that the, the core of our response here really ought to be something like a basic income uh, rather than uh, mechanisms of worker empowerment. So I want to push back against those trends in the debate. Okay, so taking the long view. Um, what has happened to, you know, you could call this production structures, they're really it's sort of the global political economy of production over the last 50 years or so, or even, you know, really over the last 100 years. We have gone from an uh, economy dominated by 
uh, vertically integrated uh, industrial firms in the global north to an economy in which most production is taking place in the global south, or a, a larger and larger uh, proportion is taking place in the global south, um, in which there are fewer and fewer industrial jobs in the north, uh, in which the north is focused largely on high-end services in its leading sectors, so finance, law, entertainment, uh, other business services, those are the growth industries in the US and in most of Europe right now. How did we get to that point? So part of the story um, is you know, the broad fissuring of production. Uh, back in the 1920s, the largest company in the US was GM. The largest factory in the world was the Ford River Rouge complex. Uh, it employed over 100,000 workers. Raw materials went in at one end. Automobiles came out at the other end. Ford was, of course, sourcing from all over the world, and you know its own production, it, it, its relationships with the U.S. states and with workers in the U.S. have to be understood in the broader context of uh, colonial and quasi-colonial regimes at the time that enabled Ford to have you know relatively low costs for uh, for raw materials. Um, there's actually a, a great book that came out a couple of years ago about Ford's efforts to start a rubber plantation. Uh, trying to forget, somewhere in South America. Uh, where was it? In Brazil. Brazil, Fordlandia, right? Um, that ended up being an abysmal failure. Um, but you know, it is sort of illustrative also because the idea was that Ford wanted their own captive rubber supplier. They wanted to have you know, a rubber supplier that was actually part of the firm. Okay, so that was, you know, that was the past, or the, you know, the, the, the deep past. Now, the recent past, you know, the leading firm in the U.S. in the 1990s and 2000s is arguably Walmart. Uh, you can't read much of what's on this slide, obviously, but I can just tell you what it represents. Uh, what is Walmart's main uh, innovation? Um, it's their supply chain management techniques. Uh, you know, they get a lot of bad press for worker exploitation, um, and there's certainly plenty of that. But the way that they have revolutionized retail is by changing the, uh, is, by, by, is by organizing their supply chains in a dramatically more efficient manner than their competitors. Um, so from Bentonville, Arkansas, the company tries to get a view of what is being produced by their suppliers, where it's being produced, where, how it's being transported to market. Um, and then t also using within Bentonville uh, quite advanced data analytics to understand changing patterns of consumer demands, both in the short term and the long term, so that goods can get to shelves remarkably quickly. Uh, this helped make them into the you know, retailing behemoth that they are. But note here, who is actually inside the company are the workers in the stores and a good number, you know, the managers, and then many of the logistics workers who are actually driving goods within the U.S., everyone else is outsourced, and all the suppliers are obviously uh, third-party companies. This is how most firms, you know, set up their business these days. The firm itself is seen as a uh, sort of modern management theory says that firms should focus on their core competencies and outsource everything else. Uh, this is a nice figure from a piece that um, Mark Berenberg wrote a couple years ago where you have a Hilton Hotel franchise, let's see if this works, nope, uh, at the center you can see it, um, at the, you know, where the three shaded areas are overlapping. On the left, they have you know, uh, services suppliers, landscaping, security, and clothing. At the top, they have their relationship with Hilton Hotels, the brand itself. And then the bottom, uh, you know, material suppliers. Who actually works for Hilton? Um, actually, not that many employees within the hotels themselves. So very often, the, uh, the housekeepers are themselves outsourced. In a good number of hotels now, even the front desk staff are outsourced to third-party companies. So the hotel is, you know, essentially a, 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 a um, uh, the hotel is essentially a branding operation that is, exists at a nexus of uh, contractual relationships with suppliers. The latest iteration of this uh, that I think is important to understand, though um, probably a little bit overblown for reasons I can talk about, is the growth of you know sharing economy or platform economy companies that make their money simply by encouraging and enabling transactions between sellers of labor and buyers. Uh, Uber is here, TaskRabbit, Care.com, Handy, many, many others. 
Um, you know, and what is Uber doing at the center there? Well, they're using, I'll talk more about this in a moment, but using advanced data analytics techniques, some forms of artificial intelligence and the like to better link together uh, drivers and customers. Um, and as a result to, uh, you know, to, in their view, create a more efficient market for taxi services. Um, what's interesting here is that the on-demand model uh, doesn't predominate in many companies, but is drawn upon by many companies. So this is a uh, schematic representation of, um, you know, an advanced uh, online retailer. Uh, you know, the retailer itself is not named, but it seems like a reasonably good representation of Amazon. What does Amazon actually do? They, you know, link together buyers and sellers, and they ensure the distribution of goods to buyers. That's at least in their, you know, the, the, the bookstore and the online marketplace. Um, much of the delivery that Amazon does is, is, uh, is performed on an on-demand model. It's actually strikingly similar to what Uber does. So they have, uh, you know, contractors who work individually delivering goods out in uh, particular neighborhoods. Um, and who are, you know, paid on the basis of particular, paid, paid by the delivery rather than given an hourly wage or anything of the sort. Amazon itself is using advanced data analytics to monitor and, you know, govern this entire supply chain or, you know, supply network, you could say it. Um, and the, in some ways you could think of this as the Walmart model and the Uber model combined together uh, and taken to, you know, truly massive scale. Okay, so we've gone from, you know, uh, Ford, vertical integration, to uh, nexuses of contracts uh, and networks of contracts in which individual players, individual workers are managed remotely uh, through, you know, technological devices. Um, what actually explains this shift? So, you know, the classic Coasean theory, uh, that's our friend Ron Coase, as imagined by Shepard Ferry, um, that firms themselves are islands of conscious cooperation in this ocean of, or, uh, of conscious power in this ocean of unconscious cooperation, like lumps of butter coagulating in a pail of buttermilk. Um, buttermilk was a bigger deal in 1937, <laughs> or a more common, you know, part of our lives, uh, sort of like quicksand maybe. Um, but the notion is that firms are command structures uh, and firms are actually set up in instances where it is cheaper to command people to do things than it is to actually purchase things on the open market. Um, and a, you know, often not recognized part of Coase's theory of the firm is that the firm and the, the boundaries of the firm are the boundaries of the employment relationship. He drew from the common law of agency, which defines employment as a legal relationship, to understand what exactly a firm was, and said it's the fact of direction which is the essence of this legal concept of employer and employee, just as it was in the economic concept of the firm. Um, part of the story that I want to tell here, let me see which signs I have. So, much of the story here is, well, how much power is being exercised, maybe to use the Uber example first, how much power is being exercised by the platform over workers who are not actually within the corporate boundary? How much power is there at this nexus that you know, uh, leads to a significant degree of direction without actually expanding the boundaries of the firm to include sellers of labor, such as drivers? Um, and you can tell a similar story about Walmart or about Amazon. Um, I'm going to skip that for now. Um, what's the effect of this? So in global context, uh, you have a couple, of, uh, a couple of sort of clearly traceable effects of the, this you know, broad shift in production strategies over the last uh, 30, 40 years. So one is the growth of an industrial working class or even middle class uh, in China uh, and in India. And that group have, you know, really sort of won uh, in the process of you know, globalization that occurred between 1988 and 2008. This is, have people seen this chart before, by the way? Branko Milovic, it's called the elephant chart. Uh, so it's tracing the increase in, uh, in real income uh, at, for different deciles of the global income distribution. So the very bottom over here and the very top over on the right. 
who has won? So that, you know, middle classes in emerging economies on the one hand and the global elite on the other. Uh, and the global elite is in, you know, finance, real estate, uh, executive positions within companies. Uh, the, you know, elite professions fall there as well. Those two groups have made out very, very well. Who has lost? Well, you know, people who essentially have not, you know, have not experienced much of any development, who are still engaging in, you know, farming or, you know, very, very small scale production. But then, you know, this 80% is a really interesting data point. 80% of the global, uh, the eighth decile um, within the global income distribution, that represents industrial workers in the U.S. and Europe, right? Industrial workers in the U.S. and Europe who were uh, fairly well off, uh, you know, 30, 40 years ago, and due to the decline of industry and the erosion of wages within many of those sectors, have actually lost ground over the last 20 years, even as you know elites within their own countries have uh, have gained handsomely. So to sort of tie this together. Uh, the expansion of global value chains is part of the story here, right? The extension of so much production work to China, India, even Bangladesh, Vietnam, all over the world has benefited workers who are actually moving into industrial jobs. Deindustrialization in the global north has actually harmed the working classes in the global north. Elites in both areas have actually benefited. Um, and you know, you can trace out any number of political consequences from the income polarization that results uh, in the global north, uh, including, you know, I would argue, the rise of populism in the US and in Europe. OK, so and how much of this is an effect of uh, technology versus law, right? Um, well, part of the story of the growth of global value chains is the growth of advanced information technologies. It's very difficult for Walmart to monitor a global supply network. Uh, without advanced information and communication technologies. Um, part of the story is the growth of data analytics that allows companies to actually set up and you know, manage global supply networks um, with a minimum of human input on a day-to-day -day level. Um, but then a, you know, an enormous proportion, and this is the argument that I, I make in the Law and the Global Sweatshop problem, it, this is the result of a, you know, an effort to design a global legal regime in which goods and capital move relatively freely across borders, uh, but workers do not, and in which workers you know, do not have rights to collectively bargain uh, against the firms that effectively control uh, their terms and conditions of labor. So think of production workers in China making iPhones for Apple, um, you know, in an earlier era, they may have been working in the United States and may have been employed by Apple, and it would be much easier to hold Apple accountable and make sure that Apple, you know, ensured they were being paid decent wages. Once they are in China, employed by a Taiwanese company, uh, and, um, you know, no longer employed by Apple at all, it's simply much more difficult to do that. But that is an, you know, the production structures like this and the law around, you know, the, the govern transnational economic transactions have co-evolved. Um, there's a ton of nuance, you know, uh, that you'd have to get into to really build out that story, but that's the, you know, that's the sort of headline. Okay, so moving on, what, uh, and, and going a little bit deeper into some of the technological questions here, what is work going to look like in 10 years? Um, and this is a shift in gears. I want to talk about why I don't see the automation threat as particularly acute, but what sorts of developments we really should have our eyes on. Um, are the robots coming? So, uh, as I said in the basic income piece, uh, you know, there's widespread concern that automation and artificial intelligence are going to displace uh, huge numbers of workers. Um, you know, our colleague Cynthia Esland at NYU Law has just written a piece about this, uh, saying that labor law scholars need to be taking automation much more seriously because it threatens the entire discipline and the entire regulatory structure that we have. If workers can be automated away, uh, then you know, the traditional tools of labor and employment law simply don't work anymore. What is artificial intelligence? Um, so a useful definition is a technology that takes in huge amounts of information and uses it to make a decision in a particular case with a specified goal. Um, I'll give some examples to kind of build this out, but as 
one of the major developments in technology, within technology companies over the last 10 years, has been what's known as machine learning techniques. So it used to be that, say, if you wanted to program a, an algorithm to translate one uh, language to another, the dominant approach would be to try to teach the computer the, the grammatical rules of the two languages uh, so that it could understand how the translation actually works. In machine learning, instead of doing that, you simply give the computer computers um, vast amounts of text in the two languages with some guideposts and have the machine essentially train itself on how the languages relate to one another. So it may not have a formal understanding of the rules of grammar. You know, the rules of grammar may not be embedded in the program at all. Uh, the aspiration is that the, 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 program it's w w the program itself will basically replicate a human's tacit and nat you know, sort of naturally obtained understanding of the rules of grammar in the language simply through such extensive exposure to two different data pools. Um, here's, I think, one of the most interesting examples of this. Uh, it's been easy to create computers to play chess for a very long time because chess has relatively few rules. Um, you know, you have a lot of rules on how the different pieces move around, but it's not actually that complicated. Uh, and then a, you know, a computer can kind of predict 17, 18 moves in advance by just running the numbers and anticipating the other party's moves. So, you know, we've had chess, pro chess programs for a really long time because of that. <coughs> the game Go, which I, you know, have never played, um, has very few rules. Uh, but a vastly greater number of possible moves uh, because of the way the board is set up. It's, uh, you know, you're putting differently colored chips onto a board and capturing territory. Google trained its uh, DeepMind's computer, uh, or DeepMind artificially intelligent, uh, you know, machine, whatever you want to call it, to play Go simply by giving it those few rules and allowing it to play, you know, 10,000, 100,000, a million games of Go. It beats one. It, it, it beats someone who's not quite a grandmaster, but is you know not not quite analogous to a grandmaster. Not one of the best people in the world, but you know pretty close to being one of the best people in the world. But what's most interesting about that is that it, it essentially developed its own ways of playing that no one had anticipated before. Um, because if you learn to play Go, you learn to play Go within a particular community. And there are different national styles, or even like regional styles or local styles for how the game is actually played. So you pick up different types of moves simply by playing with people in particular communities. The machine here didn't play in any community. It simply extrapolated from the rules, and so made moves that no human player would ever have made. And you know, the, the experts watching this said it was really like watching an alien intelligence at work. It was clearly. Uh, operating at a very, very high level, but in ways that we could not comprehend. Uh, and there are a couple points where it made moves that everyone thought was going, were going to simply end the game, uh, but they turned out, you know, 20 moves later to actually be brilliant. Okay, so machine learning sort of reproduces or supplements human knowledge in ways that we often cannot understand. Um, the question is, you know, how is this going to end up impacting labor markets? Well, you know, the, the headline uh, threat, of course, is self-driving cars that often utilize a similar technology. Rather than giving a car, you know, instructions on how to drive, you feed it maps and you feed it data from millions of trips taken by individuals so that it can, over time, understand, you know, what to do in particular situations. Um, this has led a lot of people within Silicon Valley to predict massive job displacement over the next you know, uh, 20, 10, 15, 20 years. This is from a venture capital firm saying that cashiers, uh, store clerks, retail salespeople, and their supervisors are you know, likely to be eliminated uh, in, the, um, you know, in the near future. This is from, I believe, the same uh, firm. We take for granted how little many of these services have changed in the last 50 years. You have a dry cleaner, uh, a plumber, a hairdresser, and a landscaper. More on this very soon, but if you read the tech literature, they, you know, many of them are anticipating these types of jobs being replaced by, uh, by robots and, uh, and forms of AI soon. 
I'm very skeptical. Um, so a couple reasons for that. Uh, the first is you know the dynamic effects of innovation. Um, Creative destruction has been, you know, part of the history of capitalism since we've had capitalism, uh, as I think somebody pointed out in one of the response papers. Uh, as I say in the Boston Review piece, after it automated its warehouses, Amazon said we're going to hire 100,000 new workers. Um, they're obviously displacing some existing retail workers, uh, but the net gain does still seem to be positive. Uh, part of the rationale, or part of the explanation there is that the um, the price of goods is being driven down, and the availability of goods is being driven, is being, goods are being made more readily available, which is sparking consumption, which is in turn sparking, you know, greater levels of employment. Um, in general, I would just say, wait to see the data before we predict a lot of automation, or, or a lot of uh, job displacement from automation. It's not in the data yet. The second is that the tech despite some remarkable successes, often doesn't work all that well. Uh, so, you know, IBM got access to the British National Health Service's data in an effort to train its Watson supercomputer on spotting cancer. Um, they have not been able to, you know, show any results from that yet. And there's even been some internal whistleblowing lately uh, from within the company saying that they have been, you know, dramatically overstating the extent to which they can do this. Uh, you may have heard of Ross Intelligence, uh, which is a legal research firm uh, that was heavily advertised about 18 months ago, also powered by IBM's Watson, uh, and it claimed to be able to deliver a written legal memo based on a, uh, a natural language query within 24 hours. The Times investigated. They found out that there were backroom lawyers who were, in fact, writing the memoranda and passing them off as having been produced by the AI. This is my favorite. Um, what's a chihuahua and what's a blueberry muffin? It's still pretty hard for an artificially intelligent algorithm to tell the difference. And so if you train one and say, find us pictures of chihuahuas online, you get pictures of chihuahuas and pictures of blueberry muffins um, in sort of equal measure. So uh, we've got some growth to do still. Um, another interesting data point here, uh, I, I could go on like this for a long time, but I'll wrap it up soon. Um, within the field of artificial intelligence, researchers have been predicting the emergence of so-called artificial general intelligence for about, for, you know, since around 1960. Uh, general intelligence would be artificial intelligence that essentially replicates human intelligence. At every point since, not from 1960 to the present, when you ask researchers when we're going to have artificial general intelligence or general artificial intelligence, they say in about 20 years. So in 1960, it was coming in 1980. In 1970, it was coming in 1990. Uh, so on and so forth. Now it's coming in, you know, 2035 or something like that. Okay, but here's the, here's the kind of uh, most fundamental reason. Um, is the importance of tacit knowledge in a great many jobs. Uh, Michael Polanyi, who's actually Carl Polanyi's brother, um, described this as, uh, as tacit knowledge or tacit intelligence, uh, that very often in the physical world, we know how to do things that we cannot describe. Uh, it's simply not possible for a human to actually do this. Um, to describe exactly you know, how they perform particular tasks. We do it by you know, understanding it, having done it many, many times. And that's the, it's extremely difficult to transmit that knowledge to a, uh, a robot or artificially intelligent algorithm of some sort. All of these jobs, what's remarkable about the prediction that these types of jobs are going to be eliminated is these are some of the most difficult to eliminate. To actually get dry cleaning uh, completely automated is very, very hard. Plumbing. Uh, you know, you have to have a remarkable amount of tacit knowledge about how plumbing systems work and the like in order to do that. My own, you know, kind of rough prediction here, but this is, you know, I'm not the first to have said this, but I did kind of build it out with particular job categories. What's, there are, think of jobs as, not as jobs, but as tasks. Uh, in a job, you have a number of different tasks, and what are automated are tasks rather than jobs. And only certain tasks can really be automated, which is regular tasks. It used to be that we were able to, reg to, to automate manual regular tasks. So, you know, uh, factory automation, the installation of robotics into factories is, you know, a kind of iconic example. 
um, or even the invention of uh, you know, all sorts of kitchen appliances are in some ways automating tasks that had to be, uh, had to be well, they're not automated, but they're substituting for human tasks. In any event, factory assembly work, some agricultural work, you know, maybe driving falls into this category. What's new with AI is that cognitive tasks can be automated as well. Uh, data entry, restaurant order taking, inventory tracking, right? Uh, these are cognitive tasks that computers can often now perform. Um, and that's eliminating you know, middle management jobs and other you know, semi-skilled cognitive jobs. A lot of things are not regular, a lot of tasks, cutting hair, therapy, janitorial work, you know, auto repair, home repair, delivery, we can talk about that more later. I had an interesting conversation about it over dinner last night. In the, in the, that's in the manual category. In the cognitive category, you know, child and elder care, composition, counseling, education, so on and so forth. Okay, uh, so I think we can, we can automate regular tasks but not non-regular tasks and that limits quite significantly the number of jobs that themselves can be fully automated. Final, just on a slightly lighter note, um, reason number four why I can't take predictions of AI and massive automation. Seriously, uh, so Elon Musk and many people in Silicon Valley think we're gonna see an enormous wave of automation very soon and that's gonna force you know, states to consider a basic income. Elon Musk also thinks that this has already happened and that we're living in a world created by an artificial general intelligent uh, organism or algorithm. He thinks we live in the matrix, essentially. He's gone on record saying he sees it as far more likely that we are you know, living in a computer program and figments of a computer program than that we actually live in physical reality. Um, okay, um, I'm not sure that you want to, I want to be taking sort of political cues from, you know, those types of, uh, those types of views. Okay, so I'm uh, starting to run low on time here. That's automation. What effects is technology having apart from automation? Um, this is quite interesting, I think. So uh, a lot of companies are using data analytics to track workforce performance and track employee happiness and the like uh, in ways I talk about a little bit in, my, uh, in the Boston Review piece. Rather than looking for particular achievements on resumes, you know, use a, a big data enabled program to think, to, to try to understand what exactly drives workers to stick around or leave and hire workers who are going to do that. Uh, rather than, the top one here is quite interesting, rather than, um, rather than paying prized employees much, much more, use data analytics to try to understand what that employee's midpoint, uh, what, what that employee's sort of um, uh, reservation wage is. So use data analytics and pass data on employee performance and exit to understand exactly how little additional needs to be paid to prized employees to keep them around. Um, Littler Mendelssohn has a whole initiative on this, uh, led by Zev Eigen, who used to be at Northwestern. Um, telematics is an interesting example. This is the uh, placement of all sorts of sensors, particularly in trucks and automobiles, in order to track employees' performance. Um, Uber, not Uber, UPS drivers report substantially uh, higher rates of injuries after UPS put telematics in place and required them to undertake deliveries at a much faster rate. Um, there are a lot of examples of this uh, that really kind of just, it's just a, uh, a hyper accelerated version of a form and keeping a very close eye on workers and, you know, rooting eliminating all opportunities for shirking within the, uh, within the workplace. Um, telemetrics is one point of sale technology in retail establishments that tracks how quickly cashiers can actually get through an order, uh, as well as tracking sales and determining inventory. Uh, sociometric badges that actually trace employees' movement around the firm. Uh, skip that for now. Microsoft, you might want to Google this one. They are um, developing a product that basically maps exactly what a worker does at all times uh, in, you know, in order to enhance workplace safety. One of the response papers to my talk said you should have talked more about Harry Braverman. This is like an example of 
uh, de-skilling um, at, a, at a scale we have not seen before. So once Microsoft itself has so much data on workers' task performance, it can you know, more easily push them to perform tasks quickly, uh, or push them to perform tasks more quickly. Um, and in many instances, take that information, take those skills away from workers. Uh, another example, um, taxi drivers, uh, you know, one of their, one of their uh, you know, key skills in the past was the ability to, to kind of know how to get through a particular city in the, in, you know, at rush hour. Once Uber has data on transit times and the best routes from millions and millions of trips, that knowledge is no longer embedded in drivers, but rather you know, is held by the company and can be used by the company to push drivers to move in one direction or another. Okay, bottom line. I think in the future, very few people performing regular tasks in the US uh, continued demand, though that's already largely the case, Continued significant demand in low skill and high skill non-regular services and downward pressure on wages for workers without lots of human capital. A brief note on the, that latter, this draws from efficiency wage theory, uh, which is the notion that why do employers actually pay workers well or even bring them within the firm? Because they're difficult to monitor and it's difficult to know when they want to leave. And it's difficult to you know, know whether they're using their skills appropriately. But once firms have such dramatically better information about employees, doesn't that reduce their incentive to pay uh, efficiency wages in the aggregate? Um, just what I, you know, uh, point out in the rest of the slide. And then the, you know, decline of employment relationships, again, driven by fissuring, which is enabled in many instances uh, by technological development also uh, reduces firms' incentives to pay employees well because that once they're no longer actually within the corporate boundary, norms of fair treatment that used to help govern wages uh, don't apply as strongly anymore. Okay, so what to do about this uh, in three minutes? <laughs> um, so a, a decent work agenda. Uh, I think three or four key things to do. One is enforce minimum terms through supply chain responsibility strategies and data-driven enforcement, by which I mean uh, hold companies to duties toward workers over whom they are exerting power regardless of whether they're in a formal employment relationship. Uh, second, encourage what's, you know, lo labor lawyers are increasingly calling social bargaining, which is a new sort of collective bargaining uh, that again reaches up and down supply chains to hold companies accountable to workers uh, who are within their spheres of influence. Um, and build a more universal welfare state, including perhaps a basic income. I'll say just a bit about supply chain responsibility and enforcement and social bargaining, then wrap up. So one of the, one of the advantages of uh, industry consolidation and the increased use of data to monitor workers is that it actually gives us insight into when workers are being fairly treated. Um, prior to Uber's entry into the taxi market in many uh, cities, the market was incredibly disaggregated. As represented on this slide, you have hundreds of owners of medallions, which give operating rights, which are leased out to management companies, and then you know drivers, you know, sort of sublease the medallions and drive for some period of time. If you wanted to enforce basic standards in this sector, you'd have to get all the management companies or all the medallion owners together in a room, which is you know not easy to do. There's a very very high risk of you know defection. Um, and there's not an obvious way to monitor for compliance. Uber changes that quite dramatically, right? It has a direct contractual relationship with all the drivers. It knows exactly how long they've been driving, how much they've been making, how well they've been driving. All of that data can be put to use to ensure compliance with, say, wage and hour, uh, wage and hour laws uh, and workplace safety laws. So extend that to you know, many other firms. Uh, if monitoring of workers should give rise to duties, uh, that'd be one way to do this, or you could just simply extend duties to first and second tier suppliers. I haven't talked about franchising, but this is another um, way in which workers are very often uh, legally severed from the companies that enjoy power over their working conditions. Workers at McDonald's are often employees of franchisees rather than employees of McDonald's itself, which makes enforcement against McDonald's quite hard. Again, extend the duty you know, from the, from, give the worker a right against the firm at the top of the supply chain. 
We could enhance this by requiring firms to share data uh, and then perhaps, you know, ambitiously develop um, publicly owned artificially intelligent means of understanding what is going on. And then social bargaining. So um, Kate Andreas, uh, who is at the University of Michigan, has written a great piece where she sort of names social bargaining uh, as a new uh, emerging form of union negotiation. Um, a bunch of us in the field have been talking about elements of this, and she sort of weaves them all together quite nicely. Um, what this is representing, what I'm trying to represent here is what a social bargaining regime might look like. So first, you would have to work at the supply chain level, so workers in a particular sector, or workers would have rights against, you know, companies at the top of their supply chains. It would need to operate at the sectoral level. So, you know, it could be that you have all security guards negotiating uh, with all the companies that are hiring security guards within a particular jurisdiction. You could have all fast food workers negotiating with all fast food brands. Um, covering largely economic terms and then with the state as a, you know, informal third party to the bargain or fourth party to the bargain, um, using either administrative means or even some instances kind of good offices to ensure that companies throughout the sector uh, um, follow their commitments under, uh, under whatever agreement is negotiated. There are a lot of parallels here to the First New Deal and the industrial codes of conduct that were put in place in the First New Deal. Um, but I think the easiest way to think about this would be fast food bargaining. Uh, get all fast food workers for McDonald's, Burger King, Taco Bell, etc., together in a particular jurisdiction and negotiate with all of the companies uh, within the fast food sector and set wages across the board that way. To circle back, and I'll wrap up in just a second, to circle back to the global side of things, so the Bangladesh Fire and Safety Accord is in some ways an example of this model. Uh, the Fair Food Standards Council, which is the, um, the organization that the Coalition of Immokalee Workers has set up, is in some way is, is also an example. Both of these reach, you know, up the supply chain and hold major corporations collectively accountable to the workers at the bottom. How to do this? Uh, there's some, you know, detailed reforms we could get into uh, since you haven't, you know, I don't want to presume expertise in labor law, but the basics would be to encourage state and local experimentation, make it easier for workers to unionize, uh, and, you know, have new strategies administrative agencies can take to both encourage bargaining and enforce the results of bargaining. Um, and then I think, and I'll just stop here, uh, layer economic security policies such as a basic income on top of that. Seeing uh, especially generous universal benefits as probably a consequence, uh, like a, a, a result of a changed political economy in which workers have more power rather than as a way to get workers more power in the first instance. Okay, Joey, over to you. Well, thanks so much, Christian. That was that was terrific. Um, and actually, the uh, the pieces are even richer than than the pieces you gave us. And so it's sort of, I think it speaks well of them that in responding to the parts that I wanted to respond to, I'm actually going to bring out a couple of elements from the pieces you gave us that you didn't choose to emphasize here. Um, and actually, one thing I like about about both of the written pieces you sent. Um, even more than in the talk is you a little bit straddle the line between the question of ideal policy design and the question of how to get there from here, uh, which is often the harder part of the question. So the, I, I will just start with uh, transnational uh, triangular bargaining. Your proposal that builds on the examples you cited at the end of the Bangladesh Fire and Safety Accord and the Fair Food initiative in Florida that, um, that give us a sense of how a bargaining regime might reach across countries in the global supply chain you're the most interested in. And then I'll um, circle back through to automation and finally the basic income. So, all right, um, and really all I'm trying to do is raise some questions about, uh, that I think would be interesting to hear your, your thoughts about, um, which is my uh, inevitable 
role since actually I agree with most of what you're arguing in both pieces. Okay, so, so transnational triangular bargaining, um, which I think is a really interesting contribution to how to think about uh, what the shape is of a labor agreement that would actually reach across to where production is now happening. Um, I was struck by the fact that several of the um, examples of accords that you talk about in your piece uh, that are sort of prototypes of this kind of future model, um, they involve part of the, what the firm agrees to do, the global firm, is they agree to keep production in the country where it is or even in the facility where it is for some number of years and not move it. So in a world of ephemeral uh, suppliers where there's a lot of switching around, these agreements are pushing toward less ephemeral. Um, and the, you know, I suppose the idea is also to provide some defense against the kind of legal arbitrage among nations where a company can always pick a nation with less worker-friendly policies or just go somewhere where union density has not come about, et cetera. So the question is, in, a practical, in practical terms, how do you hold up that last point of the triangle when firms are capable of moving to new countries where they don't currently have supplier relationships? There's a model in here. You say repeatedly uh, that the kind of bargaining you want to see follows rather than precedes, worker organizing, et cetera. I think that makes a lot of sense. But what happens when we have you know, new entrants from countries that have not had worker organizing in this field because the company hasn't even been there yet? It's just a sort of intricate set of practical problems that um, I know you're aware of, but I'd like to hear you say something more about. Now, at the intersection, turning here to kind of the intersection between your two pieces, um, there's this, there you have a, a fair amount of enthusiasm for um, a phrase that, that didn't come into your, your slides in the end here, but that, uh, but that I find interesting of lean production. Production that, when I, th when I hear that phrase, I just think of Toyota the sort of Toyota model of incremental improvements in industrial technology, uh, industrial processes, the idea of which is that workers are going to be able to be more productive if they can ask questions about and help make processes more efficient. And you seem to have a hope that that kind of process, that way of thinking about production, can result in more surplus for workers in the end. And yet, when I was thinking about it, it struck me that this Toyota model actually has a lot in common with automation, right? Both of these are ways that production processes can um, increase the productivity of labor. They involve some capital, maybe more in the case of automation, um, but some either way. I don't think it's a coincidence that Toyota rather than Nike is who implements this Toyota system, right? Because they've got a big industrial settings with lots of machines where they can think a lot about how to make everything more efficient. Um, so if both automation and lean production are sort of related stories about making workers more productive with capital playing some role in that, um, how should we think about uh, what ways of doing this would actually benefit workers? I mean, maybe we should embrace automation in the sweatshops. Uh, you know, where, where in the intersection between these two stories do we find the answer to the question, does this increase in productivity actually redound to workers' benefit in any way? Um, and there's a related set of questions you could raise about the productivity enhancing surveillance technologies that you talk about, uh, which I agree seem kind of sinister. Um, and there's this, there's this picture that I, that I get from your picture of those technologies, which is sort of that there's this vast um, kind of hidden, inefficient, monitoring cost-based um, set of, uh, you know, benefits that workers are all enjoying mm -hmm. that we didn't even notice until now that they start to get taken away. And so the odd thing is the taking away of those inefficiencies looks like a productivity improvement. 
which ought to create the surplus from which, at least in theory, you know, some of that surplus could go to the workers as well as the firm. So why not or you know, under what circumstances? Now, a simple answer to that kind of question uh, is, well, maybe more likely under circumstances where there's more union density and that sort of stuff. And so I wanted to raise um, for you, um, and I, I agree that that's a big piece of the story, a comparison that really struck me. I think this was originally um, a comparison I heard Larry Summers make, and then the New York Times picked up on it with, a, with, a, pick, with an article about two janitors um, a few weeks ago, a janitor at Kodak 30, 40 years ago, and a janitor at Apple today, both uh, doing pretty much the same job for actually, interestingly, the same wage, more or less, inflation adjusted, um, but completely different career paths and lives with the worker at the vertically integrated firm of 40 years ago enjoying great benefits and also a career path through the company and the janitor at Apple today because of all the fragmentation that you describe being a completely contingent worker with none of that stuff. Um, but it's the latter one, the current Apple subcontractor employee, who's actually an SEIU member, and the Kodak employee wasn't. And so that's not any kind of dispositive evidence of anything. Obviously, union density was way greater back you know, 40 years ago. But it is a sort of provocative question. There must be some very big tectonic plates um, that have moved to make those jobs that different, um, that just unionization isn't a sufficient sort of answer. And so I'm, I would be very interested in your thoughts about the, um, the rest of it. Um, so last, just make one quick comment about the, uh, the basic income question and your, your reframing of it, which I think is really useful. Uh, so you talk a bit in, in the basic income piece and also in your talk about a kind of um, hollowing out effect that a lot of other uh, people have also sort of raised concerns about hollowing out effect of automation on the spectrum of jobs in which automation doesn't threaten all the jobs. You know, your Amazon example is terrific uh, to show that it may not threaten even all the jobs at the, um, at the low end. But it does enable a lot of de-skilling, as you describe, um, in a way that leads to, you know, I mean, the classic examples like travel agents getting replaced by people who design software and maybe some call center employees who are probably in India, and not the white collar jobs in the middle. And so I feel like a lot of the solutions, the way you frame them, um, they speak to aspects of the bottom half of the story. They speak to sort of like basic income as you frame it, where it's sort of uh, a social welfare improvement for everybody at the bottom, plus maybe a strike fund, right? That's um, a story that's primarily going to be benefiting those who are at the bottom and the most left out. Um, but I'm not sure that or minimum wage, which is even more targeted at the bottom, I'm not sure those answers necessarily um, would directly address the question of the hollowing out of the middle, like do we need a middle class? Uh, is it a distinct problem to not have a middle class? Um, what, do you, uh, what do you think would need to happen to turn the de-skilled jobs of the future into a middle class life? Um, or is that how you would even frame the question? So anyway, I think, as you can tell, I have, uh, I think this, your, your piece has raised no end of, of uh, terrific, fascinating issues, and I hope you'll, um, I look forward to hearing your response. Great, Great. thank you. Take, um, just uh, question two and question four very briefly. So question two, I think you said something really provocative. Question two is 
lean production and the impact of lean production uh, on workers' fortunes. Um, you're absolutely right that it, it should create space for a higher skill and therefore higher value added uh, inputs by workers and you know Richard Locke says the evidence is quite clear that that is what happens in the garment sector. You move to, and it's weird, I, I'm not sure lean production, um, uh, it's, it's a weird term to use for this because in the laborite context, lean production has a very negative connotation um, of squeezing workers as much as possible. You know, Locke uses it for a form of production that doesn't actually squeeze workers, uh, but rather empowers them by giving them a, a larger skill set and changing the organization of production in a kind of Toyota-ish way uh, to give them a bit more discretion. In any event, I think you're exactly right uh, on the you know the contributions of uh, some degree of automation to worker earning, um, and you know workers' ability to actually you know bargain for a higher share of uh, of the surplus. That's point one. Point two, I think you're also exactly correct, and you put it very nicely. Uh, that there is a that sort of monitoring technologies are taking away a dividend that workers didn't quite realize they had. Um, it, that, that is exactly what I think. Um, and you know, I think your statement of it is really nice. Um, I can say more about sort of automation. I heard a very interesting story about automation in the garment and electronic sector, which I'll share later. But to come back to the, um, the question of a broad middle class, I think it's an incredibly difficult one. Um, Two points on it. Uh, yes, UBI and minimum wage and social bargaining among a lot of the workers I'm talking about uh, is going to raise the floor, but not to a middle class level. Um, certainly not to you know the level of an industrial worker in the mid-century. Um, one approach to that, it's a bit of a punt, uh, is that we should be thinking about a middle class standard of living rather than middle class wages, which are distinct, right? And so a more social democratic welfare state would actually deliver a middle class standard of living to a greater number of workers without necessarily requiring them to pay for it uh, out of their own wages. Um, you can, and so you can make many jobs into kind of lower middle class jobs. Um, that gets us part of the way there, but not all the way there. Second is a broader, you know, almost methodological point. Um, a labor economist pointed out to me, and I think is exactly correct, we have all sorts of uh, um, proposals for labor law reform, uh, ethnographies, and, uh, and other studies of what the very bottom of the labor market looks like. And we're focused on that for good reason. It's a pretty bad place to be. You know, wages have stagnated. Uh, it's a place where you know, uh, immigrants and women and people of color generally are overrepresented. You know, if we're committed to a fair society, we've got to take a close look at the very bottom of the labor market. Um, but the number of workers at the very bottom is actually not all that big. Um, it, you know, there still is a big middle. Uh, and he said, define it, I think this is right, as people with some college but not a college education. Uh, so you have a ton of healthcare and education workers in that category, a lot of childcare workers, uh, many, many restaurant workers, all sorts of office workers. My field just actually doesn't have as much of an understanding of what those jobs are like and what the you know, difficulties are that are faced uh, there. Um, in part because of the focus on the very bottom. And it's true in labor law, and I think it's also true in kind of labor sociology. Um, so there are very interesting questions to be asked uh, about that group. Okay, I'll stop now. Right. Should I stand here? Um, yeah. Yeah, okay. I'm just going to sort of come back here a little bit to call on people. Um, or you can call on people, except that the first uh, <coughs> Um, so the first couple of questions, um, does she come from the students in the class? Um. Uh, I had asked the same question as I think the first one Professor, Professor uh, Pitkin had asked. What room is there for workers in developing countries to have these reforms? So that's the... We just want to get out the video. Okay. So if you guys don't mind speaking to the mic, it's on. So the, here, I'll give it back. You're good. Um, 
what room is there for workers in developing countries? Sorry. Can you say, sorry, now there's having so taken the mic away, can you say a little bit more? <laughs> some ridiculous percentage, like 80% of the export to exports of Bangladesh are ready-made garments, right? Yep. So if you really were able to organize all of those workers into this massive social bargaining unit, why would you not just see a massive uh, exodus of, of capital and foreign direct investment? Sure. So I think there's a couple things. Um, uh, you know, this gets to uh, whether we should be, it gets to sort of what baseline assumptions we want to make about the way that economic activity happens. Um, and the notion that foreign direct investment is going to flee, uh, you know, is a natural one under current rules because FDI can flee. Um, you know, but we could have different rules that would make it much harder for FDI uh, to leave, right? You know, what effects that would have on capital allocation, you know, is a different question, but certainly there could be ways for Bangladesh to actually keep capital within the country. I think that's sort of answer one. I think answer two, um, that you know, one of the things I was going to say to Joey's question, what enforces the requirement to actually keep work in those countries? It's not law, certainly. Um, it can be norms uh, to the extent that you have uh, brands such as Walmart and other um, you know, garment, produ garment producers, essentially, uh, who are susceptible to consumer pressure. Norms can actually uh, play quite a significant role. Um, and then you do have issues of path dependence, right? So why is DACA um, you know, such a favorable location now? Uh, you know, it didn't start out as one. The transportation network was pretty bad. Uh, the, you know, it was difficult to get raw materials in. But you do now have a dense network of garment producers in the area with, you know, we call it unskilled work, but it's not really, right? Uh, it does take a fair amount of skill to sew a garment, and it takes even more skill to sort of manage a garment production process. Um, it, the path, the, 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 the concentration of that knowledge in particular areas is an impediment to, you know, the, the, um, the work moving elsewhere. Okay, all that being said, absolutely, if we drive the wages in Bangladesh, you know, significantly higher, you'll surely see companies, you know, sourcing from elsewhere. Um, this gets back to, you know, the need for some governance arrangements that can actually stabilize the sector, is what I would say. Um, and I would see transnational triangular collective bargaining as uh, a first step, but I think I do say in the piece, in the longer run, what you would want to see are, you know, global governance institutions that can actually, you know, set, establish means of dialogue and coordination between worker representatives and companies um, in order to plan out production in appropriate ways. Um, so I think that's the basic answer, right? That like, yes, if we raise the wage floor very, very high, we'll certainly see some capital flight, but that invites the question of what else we can do uh, to encourage companies to actually stay. Yes, um, my question is concerning the collective bargaining regime that you recommend. Uh, within the national context, uh, there is usually an enabling law which gives uh, workers the right to group up and bargain and produce what we call collective agreements which are enforceable by law. Now, we are talking about a transnational cross-border kind of arrangement. What kind of enabling legal regime do you think will support such an arrangement and how feasible do you think that can be done within the politics of the world that we have now? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so like so many uh, you know, contemporary economic and social phenomena, you'll see a, a, a role for national level law uh, and a role for transnational law, uh, and possibly a role for, you know, international law or standard setting at, for example, the ILO level. Um, the question, how would this work in, say, you know, take an easy example of uh, South and Southeast Asia as the jurisdiction in which you want to see, you know, TTCB emerge. 
You'd need to have uh, Bangladesh, Vietnam, Cambodia, and perhaps China, um, you know, revise labor law to make it easier for workers both to unionize uh, and to make it clear that they can actually um, negotiate together with workers from other countries and I think take industrial action uh, against companies that are uh, outside of the nation's borders and who are not their employers. Um, that would require, that may require law reforms, you know, in each country to actually establish that. Um, once that has been done, uh, you know, it would certainly be legally feasible for the unions to actually come together and bargain. There's a difficult question of enforcement. Um, the way the Bangladeshi the, uh, Fire and Safety Accord deals with this is by subjecting disputes to binding arbitration that are actually in f with, the, with the arbitration awards enforceable in a national court. Um, and the, the forum choice there is to put disputes into the national court of the brands, you know, whether it's H&M or Walmart or Gap. Um, so the federal, you know, federal courts in the U.S. would have jurisdiction to enforce a judgment uh, against Gap. Um, you know, that strikes me as, uh, as, as good as anything else that we're likely to get. Um, you know, in some conversations today, I've actually started thinking maybe this is a, 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 a project to take on in a year or so, um, but just to think about what, is the, what are the questions of legality um, at work in these new types of bargaining arrangements? How do we think of them as forms of lawmaking? Um, are they, you know, does a, a classical pluralism model account for them in which, you know, workers are participating in industrial rulemaking at their, you know, um, at their own workplaces? Um, do we have to think of them as, uh, you know, as, as, as uh, on the, in, somewhere on the continuum or somewhere on the, on the, you know, sort of multivariate spectrum between hard law and soft law, right? Um, I mean, I think the basic answer is that uh, it would be an emerging form of governance. I think enforcement is not going to be uh, predominantly through litigation or administrative agency action. Um, but that is the case in most mature collective bargaining regimes in industrialized countries anyway, right? In you know, the US, Germany, Italy, you know, most countries do not actually go in the first instance to a court to enforce the terms of a collective bargaining agreement. What they do is set up mechanisms between the parties to settle the dispute. question that's sort of on point with something that's on the table, if you raise two fingers, um, then we'll give you priority so we can keep the conversation going. Sure. So thank you for coming today. I was really interested in your discussion of the future of work and how that intersects with the politics of gender necessarily um, on various scales. And I was just sort of thinking how technological innovation isn't necessarily gender neutral when we think of the automation of work. and who is behind this automation and how it affects people of different genders or how certain labor markets exist and have different forms of work. And so I was wondering what you think about the future of work and in saying that perhaps automation is not as big of a threat as we think in certain industries. Um, how does that play out in terms of industries that may be gendered in certain ways um, and how that affects people? Sure. Um, I think it's a really rich question. I'm going to go to a slide to help illustrate some thoughts on it. So um, this is, I don't remember if I showed this before. This is a slide on uh, what's known as skill bias technological change. And what it purports to show is the, uh, where jobs are being created within the overall you know, skill range. Uh, and that over the 1980 to 2010, many jobs have been created that are in high skill and low skill sectors. And many jobs have been eliminated in sort of mid skill sectors. Um, now, what are the biggest groups in these uh, different areas? So the mid-skill is uh, industrial workers, right? More men than women, uh, also a heavily racialized labor market. Um, those jobs have been disproportionately eliminated. Uh, what's being created at the top end? You know, 
executive positions, finance positions, tech-based positions, the high-level professions. Again, these cut on gender lines. Men are overrepresented in you know, these occupations. Who's at the very low skill level? Uh, janitors, farm workers, uh, restaurant workers, child care providers, income, in, in, income, in home care providers, um, who are predominantly or disproportionately uh, female. So uh, that's sort of like a first cut at an answer. The way I then start to complicate it is that uh, you know, the very ways in which we assign jobs to, notion, to, to skill percentiles itself strikes me as deeply gendered, right? It's not an accident that we say that, you know, the job of uh, cleaning a hotel room and making hotel beds is a low skill job. I can't make a hotel bed. Um, I'm pretty skilled, right? On, on this metric, like, you know, I've got a law degree, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm up here. I can't make a hotel bed. Uh, you know, I, I can't bust a table very well. I can't wait tables very well. I mean, I've done it in the past. I can't do it anymore. Uh, I certainly couldn't be a child care provider, um, you know, for a very long period of time. I love taking care of my kids, but if I were doing it for eight hours a day with other people's children, it'd be, you know, it'd be challenging. So, you know, what do we assign to the low skill end of the spectrum? Well, that itself is, I think, deeply, deeply gendered. These are jobs that, you know, tend to pay low wages. Think of this as actually, you know, it's ranked by wage, um, but the you know wage levels themselves are effects of you know uh, social practices, social norms which are deeply gendered, um, and you know our traditions of collective bargaining which are you know also deeply gendered. Um, I guess I'd just say you know with further automation, I think it's tricky to say. Um, I mean, I do think that we'll see continued job creation down uh, in, the, in the occupational categories that I mentioned earlier. Um, so, you know, more jobs created that have typically gone to, uh, to women and very often people of color. Um, declining male labor force participation is a big phenomenon in the U.S. and, you know, many other industrialized countries. So, uh, there are many, I think there are some states in the U.S. in which the, you know, female labor force participation rate is actually now higher than the male. Um, but there is, you know, that wage gap. Um, and then finally, you know, I, I think you'd have to be, um, you know, uh, blind to not recognize the, both the, the gender makeup of who is actually uh, making decisions and programming things in Silicon Valley, and then the gender politics of Silicon Valley, especially given the recent allegations uh, you know, out of Uber and other companies. So. Hey, thanks for the talk. Um, so I was wondering while reading your papers and during the talk, um, you're, you're mentioning that um, a lot of countries with low wage sector production uh, intensive uh, countries should unionize. But I wonder, um, those countries often have like low wage, low wage level as their comparative advantage to other countries. So I wondered if, if there wouldn't be a strategy of some countries to deviate from, from these uh, unions in order to be more competitive than the others and like attract a lot of capital that is like um, flowing out of these countries potentially. I mean, I, uh, I think you're absolutely correct um, is the basic answer. It gets to the, the, the first question um, and some of my answer to the first question, which is uh, how much of that is an effect of, um, you know, the legal regimes and norms that we have right now around transnational production. Um, you would certainly see a, you know, a high potential for defection. And for this reason, like, I, I don't see... I didn't intend the, um, the transnational collective bargaining paper to be predictive so much as illustrative, like how significant of a change would we have to see in order to solve these problems. I will say that, um, you know, again, one effect of being able to put in place a stable collective bargaining regime is that you can often uh, solve capital's collective action problem, right, uh, and make it so that, um, uh, and solve states' own collective action problems in this instance. Uh, so if we were able to get that sort of collective bargaining regime off the ground, the unions would not just be, 
acting as economic actors in their countries, but also as political actors in their countries and political actors at the global level, uh, and potentially pushing for policies that could mitigate that threat. Um, there's an example of this that I, I don't talk about in the paper. Maybe I do, actually. Um, maybe in a footnote. Um, there's a campaign to establish a uh, region-wide minimum wage for garment workers in South and Southeast Asia. Um, and the idea is actually not to have a single wage rate, um, but rather to have the countries and producers agree on a, uh, on purchasing, on, on a wage rate based on purchasing power parity within particular countries. Um, and you know, the proposal is, has gotten quite far and you know, makes a good amount of economic sense. Can we establish a wage rate in Bangladesh that is you know, at PPP comparable to what you would have in Vietnam? And then you know, sort of hold wage rates steady or raise them you know, over time. You know, they haven't had much political success yet, but the, you know, the, the idea itself, I think, is, is straightforward and compelling. Um, Dan had a two on that. Uh, right, thanks. So, so I, 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 I'm going to try to channel the Fair Food Standards Council and how they might see the solution to this problem, right? And, and I think they might say something like, um, you're aiming at the wrong end of the value chain. Um, if, if you, so for them, it's tomato pickers and tomato farmers in Florida, right? If, they, if, if a group of tomato pickers in one farm negotiates with that farm to get better wages, then Walmart will just buy from the cheaper farm next door, mm -hmm. right? And that's the problem you have. But they would say, actually, so aim at the top of the value chain, negotiate a deal with Walmart. Well, Walmart agrees to enforce standards down the chain, and then you avoid kind of the whole competition problem, the race to the bottom, and that whole thing, right? And, and so then how would you make that work, right? Rather than trying to get Bangladesh and Vietnam and everybody else to agree to a, a comparable minimum wage or to get China and Vietnam and everybody else to have decent labor laws, right? I mean, you, you have sort of workers mobilizing to get consumers active to get the people at the top of the value chain mm -hmm. to buy into the better standards, right? And that seems maybe more feasible. I don't know. I mean, do you have any? I totally agree. I mean, to the extent that I seem to be saying anything else, I, you know, maybe I was sort of moving at a different aspect of the problem. Um, no, you, you, yeah, you have to, the, I mean, we'll see there's like a tiny bit of a chicken egg issue, right? So yes, you have to get brands to take responsibility, but you have to have sort of some power on the ground in order for brands to take responsibility. Um, you know, change in this sector tends to come uh, through kind of, you know, breakthrough moments and crises. And I think that's what led up to the Bangladesh Accord. Um, whether it's really taking root on the ground is another question, um, but let's not get distracted by that now. Um, to the extent I was talking about like legal changes in Vietnam, Bangladesh, and the like, that was kind of, I was trying to get at what would it take to legally instantiate this bargaining system into, uh, you know, into the legal regimes that we have. How would the legal regimes that we have actually end up playing into this? Um, and I do think that would, you know, something like that would probably happen if the <coughs> model started to take off. Um, I guess I'll say one other thing, which is that uh, you can't really start with Walmart, right? Uh, no one's been able to start with Walmart. Uh, you start with, um, you know, Bangla the Bangladesh Accord started kind of with H&M, um, which is Swedish. So they're very susceptible to domestic pressure from consumers in Sweden, uh, not to mention unions in Sweden. Um, and then Benetton kind of joined on, and Inditex was tough to get on. That's the parent of Zara. Um, you know, they're based in Spain, or I think, you know, just number one, huge, and number two, not as susceptible to consumer pressure. But anyway, you know, you got to build to it by getting those other, you know, players to actually come along. Um, and the Fair Food Standard Council has done the same thing with tomatoes, right? So they started, I think, with Taco Bell and then moved to Burger King. Uh, they haven't gotten Wendy's yet, but they, you know, pick off big targets. What's that? Do they have Walmart? They do. Okay. Good. Right. So <laughs> they probably got. Whole Foods is the obvious ones, but Walmart's. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I'd like to know the story there, right? But it wasn't their first target, right? They got there after doing uh, after doing the restaurants. So. Can I say I think there's a really interesting um, 
to sort of go back to a theme, and this even touches on the conversation that you and I were having earlier, I think there's something potentially interesting in the air here, again, about like what's the notion of legality and governance that's actually emerging here, right? It's not sort of on the hard law, soft law spectrum exactly. Like, is it, you know, I think the idea of imperfect duties that we were talking about probably doesn't help that much, but like there's something under theorized that I, I think maybe could be fruitful to think about. So, two questions. One is sort of where is capital in this story? Um, and you know, uh, how much is it sort of incumbent on the left labor and employment law sort of utopian architect to have an architecture of, you know, controlling and expropriating capital? How, you know, how far can you go with, um, particularly, obviously, the, the, you know, the, the kind of robust version of basic income that has to do a lot of work. You know, it was a, it was a kind of line in passing because you said, well, it's an understudied space. But it's a kind of important space because it's the space where everything is disappearing. You've sort of given us a, a sort of landscape in which there will remain you know, jobs at the top and jobs at the bottom. The answer for the bottom is sectoral work. And then there's the middle. Now I have some ideas for that that I'll get to in a moment. But, the, but, the, but I think the other part of the challenge is if, if you're gonna both do justice to the global value chains and therefore redistribute you know, a good deal of what had been going to capital to the sectoral bargaining unions in Bangladesh and South Asia. And you're gonna underwrite the vanished middle class through a huge sort of basic income. And you're gonna have to take a shitload of wealth away from capital. And what's the sort of, how do you do that? Obviously, a big question. But, but even in the broadest strokes, or just as a methodological question. Yep. And is there no relationship between how you imagine dealing with capital and how you imagine dealing with Totally. So that's one thing. And then the other is about the middle. Mm -hmm. And it goes, so if, if one qu that question was from the left, this is from the right. The, sir, the way, you know, as, as different, you know, as, as much as we're, we're different generations, you and I were both taught in a certain broadly Marxian tra tradition to think about radical changes have to in some ways emerge out of emerging sort of relations and institutional arrangements that are either inherited or emergent. And sectoral bargaining is neither, as near as I can tell. It doesn't have a fit with either American institutional practices in the past, or perhaps with what's emerging, you know, or at least I haven't heard a tale except, you know, much of a tale about how it's, you know, implicit. So if a lot of what sort of institutional economy Speeches is the things that work tend to be things that have to fit. Mm -hmm. The question is where's the fit? And with respect to the vanishing middle, the fit may be um, sort of small business credit. May you know there may be sort of political stamp that you want to sort of sort of entrepreneur sort of that the that the Western world or the U.S. version of micro enterprise is just you know build up a movement for credit. Or millions of otherwise casualized, precarious part timers. Mm -hmm. That's sort of a kinder word for the basic income, Bruce Ackerman, liberal you know, discourse that we tend to sort of, to some extent, be dismissing. So, um, there's a lot there. Um, Where's capital? So capital is uh, at the absolute center of the story. So I put this slide back up because part of the story of what's happened in the hotel sector over the last 20 years or so uh, is that a lot of hotels have been bought up by private equity. Uh, and that the um, 
you know, the model is to buy with leverage, shed all uh, obligations that can be shed, uh, sell off assets that can be sold, uh, and then, you know, take the thing back into the markets or sell it to a buyer and to make a profit that way. Um, there has not been a whole lot of scholarship drawing the connections between financialization and uh, the fissuring of employment. I think everyone who studies it says that financialization is a big part of the story. Um, but there's not a ton of you know, empirical work kind of trying to trace it out. There's one piece that's just come out from, um, uh, I'm not gonna remember her name now, um, a woman, uh, a female, woman economist in DC, um, that's starting to make some of the connections. There's a little bit in the global value chains literature um, but I think that a, you know, a reasonable first approximation of the story is that what has happened in the wealthy countries in the last you know, X number of years is that a tremendous amount of capital has been redistributed from the middle to the top, right? Um, it's skill bias, technological change, you know, but you could simply, this is also a rough approximation of the distribution of wealth and how that has changed over that period of time. And a hell of a lot of money that was, you know, being held by uh, people in the middle was shunted off to the top, in part through labor practices, in part through, you know, the, the collapse of the housing market, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's answer one on where's capital is like simply at the very, very middle. Um, on what is the strategy for the middle class, uh, I, I might just have to punt on that one and come back to you on it because I really don't know. Um, you know, what percentage of the broad middle class is actually small entrepreneurs at this point? Um, in the US, I, you know, I do not know. It's a decent percentage. Uh, you know, in so many cities right now, opportunities for entrepreneurship are drying up because of consolidation. You know, if you see a new development in almost any you know, of the bougie cities that I end up traveling to. Uh, they're populated not by local independent businesses, but by you know, chains. Um, maybe many middle income entrepreneurs are operating franchises. Uh, you know, many are working in the you know, like home construction and home repairs and the like. Um, you know, how does one get that group on board with a broad institutional change? Uh, I do not know. I mean, I, Healthcare may be a big chunk of it uh, in the long run. Um, and perhaps, you know, maybe this is what you're getting at, maybe it's something about, you know, tax relief, you know, leading to universal benefits that they are, you know, getting tax relief and we're taxing the wealthy much, much more. Whether they would go for that ideologically, you know, is anyone's guess. Uh, you know, there is a, an 18th Brumaire sort of story lurking here, I think. It's a little bit of a follow-up, and then um, all right. But I, so it's a little bit of follow-up, maybe on the more time of the capital and the and, and the thinking about distribution from away from the top, more in a more focused way. Um, and one of the things about the piece that um, I really liked a lot, the global sweatshop problem, was when you set forth at the beginning the discussion about. Bits and the WTO and GATT as the hard law that was facilitating, if not, well, the movement of capital and mm -hmm. um, foreign investment and all the kinds of issues mm -hmm. that sort of half of the discussion is talking about. Um, and then the problem was that labor rights and all of that was um, in the soft one. I get that you're pushing, you're, you're moving away from that characterization, which I think is a good idea on one hand. On the other hand, it's kind of interesting that the responses are either like the Fair Foods Council and the Bangladesh Accords, which are very much about contracts between the mm -hmm. suppliers and the buyers, or there's some vague idea about some global, I think that's where the tension was in the go, right? Like, well, couldn't we have a governance structure that through the ILO or some other means that would try to allow um, some coalition building among workers yeah. in different countries? But I kind of wanted to go back to, well, what about GATT and BITS and the WTO? Mm -hmm. Couldn't we 
what, what if we change those rules? I mean, um, why isn't that the place to start? Like, sure, back to the social clause debates. Um, so, in, so the most successful uh, trade labor linkage um, is actually, I think, arguably the U.S. generalized system of preferences, um, you know, which is permitted under the GATT. Um, do people have any familiarity with this? It, it's a, it's a. Um, so under the GATT, the uh, nations are able. That's the general agreement on tariffs and trade. Nations are permitted to uh, give preferential treatment to exports from the least developed countries. Um, and, you know, so that means that whereas if you're importing, um, you know, textiles from, uh, I don't think Mexico qualifies for GSP anymore, they might still be faced with a 25% tariff at the border. Uh, textiles from Bangladesh, uh, not in the US, interestingly, but in Europe, would come in duty free. So Bangladesh's garment sector actually exports a lot more directly to the EU than to the US um, because of that. But the US has used the, general, the GSP quite a, you know, a number of times to actually push back against unfair uh, labor practices and to encourage trading partners to, to you know, increase their enforcements. Um, Guatemala was one case, I think. Did we just get a judgment on that? Yeah, right, which was not the judgment that a lot of us were hoping for, right? Um, but certainly, yeah, I mean, why not attach trade conditionalities? Uh, why not, you know, can the EU do that internally uh, to stop social dumping, right? This is one of the big flashpoints, or was in the 1990s and early 2000s in European integration. To what extent are we harmonizing labor laws and to what extent are workers, you know, carrying their neoliberal entitlements across the border with them when they cross from one nation into another. Um, why don't I talk about it more? Uh, I, I, I guess I think because in many ways that ship has sailed, right? Like the Doha round is stalled. It doesn't seem like we're going to get back to GATT, uh, to, 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 you know, um, true global <coughs> multilateralism as the way in which we're structuring the trade regime. Um, but, you know, it's worth considering on the NAFTA side. Um, I've wanted to write an editorial for a while, and I've held back because it's going to piss off, like, almost everyone I know. But making the argument that the U.S. labor movement should, do, should stop worrying so much about imposing labor conditionalities in our own treaties. Um, and protecting, or sorry, that the U.S. labor movement should worry much less about uh, you know, let me just table that. It's kind of a different question. Um, we can talk about it later. So to pick up your question specifically, why not renegotiate in NAFTA, you know, significantly stronger labor protections and say, well, why don't we have a transnational collective bargaining regime for garment workers in Mexico and the U.S. or auto workers in Mexico and the U.S. Um, and see if we can start to actually develop forms of solidarity and, you know, uh, cross-border concerted action that are much more robust than what the NAFTA labor side agreement encourages or, or it has encouraged in the past. So short answer, yes. I mean, I'm not particularly optimistic, right? I think that you have to have, um, you have to have uh, this sort of movement on the ground. Do you have a follow up on that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. well, it's just to say that I think you're, what I find powerful with that part of the argument or that part of the piece is that it's not as though there isn't transnational or international law out right. there. Right. It makes a difference. <coughs> yeah. There is. Yep. Let's look at what it is. Yeah, totally. So, um, yeah. Totally. This brings up another point that I was like, sort of, let me take the prerogative to mention very, very briefly. Um, we haven't talked much about sort of the forms of social solidarity that are necessary in order for collective bargaining regimes or even just social movements to emerge. Um, and it's fairly straightforward. It's sort of easy to understand how that happens in factories. If you get thousands and thousands of workers together in one place and they hate their jobs, like they're going to strike. And it turns out that that happens all the time now in China. Uh, you know, industrial workers in China are, you know, some of the most militant in the world in many ways, despite not having any collective bargaining rights that we would recognize under U.S. law. Um, not to mention freedom of association. Um, very, very difficult 
question, and here this gets to kind of Willie's point about you know emergent social practices. What are where are the emergent social practices that could ripen into a transnational workers' movement, um, or even a domestic workers' movement? Uh, I think we have sort of little pockets of it here and there, but nothing you know, that gives me all that much hope in the short term that it will emerge. But, you know, those things can also happen very, very quickly, right? Uh, the, the, you know, social formations can come together very, very quickly in unpredictable ways. All right. So thanks, Bruce. This is all very fascinating. Um, so focusing on, on the technological or technologically driven processes you described of, you know, control, monitoring, surveillance, and again, focusing on substance rather than process. So, you know, bargaining and unionization, very important, obviously, but that's process. Focusing on substance. I, the, I see at least three different things going on here. There, there are probably more, but here are the three I see. You know, one, one issue here is basically those technologies and processes create, at least often create, new efficiencies, but they come also with, you know, redistribution and transfers usually from employees to employers, and what to do about that. And perhaps interestingly, it's different than the story you reject of, you know, robots will take all the jobs, but the kind of questions are similar, right? And therefore, perhaps the solutions and debates, right? Because it's about redistribution mm -hmm. and efficiency. So that's one set of issues. A different set of issues, again, given rise to by, by those processes, is about what you might call rights in the sense of fundamental human interests other than income and resources, right? So it's easier to see with surveillance technologies, right? Uh -huh. Some of it is the processes themselves that impinge on such rights, and some of it is the upshots of the processes, like the very nice example you described of the ri rising rate of injuries, right? So that's a different set of issues, and I don't know, perhaps the kind of solution we should be thinking about here is a new brand of labor protective legislation or something like that. And finally, quickly, a third set of issues that to me seems different, seems to be different, is basically sort of the, the changing character or even nature of work, right? They seem to be describing basically a new process of alienation, right? Mm -hmm. Almost worse than the assembly line, like, you know, Charlie Chaplin should remake the scene from modern times, right? Imagine the you don't have to imagine, it's happening already. The employer is under constant surveillance and control and monitoring, right? So this is a third issue, and this one, I don't know what to do about Maybe you have ideas. Yeah. Um, so this is great. Uh, I'm really glad you asked it, in part because it, um, you know, my title was uh, Law, Technology, and Economic Citizenship, but I didn't talk about the citizenship piece and what I mean by that. Uh, that's in part because I'm trying to work out in my head exactly how to think about it. Um, but I would endorse this, right? So there's this sort of, you know, a distributional and efficiency type question about how production is going to be organized and how uh, rents or, you know, profits are distributed. Um, or allocated. Uh, put, you know, we've talked a fair amount about that, so put it to the side. I think that you're exactly right that there is a separate set of concerns that kind of get to issues of uh, dignity, uh, equal social standing, um, you know, equality in a very different sense, you know, forms of social equality rather than economic equality. Um, so, in, in the book, I want to tease out two, at least two aspects of that. One is uh, the changing um, nature of privacy rights. Um, there's obviously been a ton written about this, um, but you know, if one is being observed in a way that you know affronts one's dignity, um, that can be the basis for a privacy claim under U.S. law. It's pretty difficult under U.S. law. And part of the problem with uh, trying to rebuild, trying to kind of you know, put privacy rights as one of the main methods of worker protection, this is a move some people are doing, saying if, if we protect privacy, we'll protect, you know, we'll protect uh, discrimination as a side effect. Some have also said if we protect privacy, that will really you know, do more to protect workers' um, you know, take-home pay and the like. Part of the problem is that US law is quite clear that work-related 
questions are open season, that an employer's monitoring of a worker's performance triggers no privacy protection or privacy question whatsoever. Um, we might have a norm against it, uh, but that's a very different norm from the norm that says an employer can't you know, look at you when you're in the bathroom, for example. Um, that's sort of tranche one. Tranche two under the dignitary rights is, uh, so if privacy is the right to keep certain things private and you know, out of public view, there's another set of questions here, which is what has to be made public about your work performance? Uh, what rights do you have to actually access information about your work performance? Um, easy example here, uh, can you understand the, you know, if you're an Uber driver, can you know the comments that riders are making about you? Um, do you have a right to actually access that information? Um, Slightly more difficult one, do you have a right to access your employer's data on your performance uh, and carry that you know, from job to job? Um, if it's actually beneficial to you, do you have a right for your record to be cleared after a while if it's not beneficial to you? Um, Frank Pasquale has written some, you know, some good stuff about this. Um, I think there's much, much more to be said. Um, and then to you know, kind of get into broader questions of political economy, should uh, firms that are using um, very extensive data-based management techniques be required to disclose that data to regulators or to worker organizations. Uh, you know, should regulators be able to know about you know hours, rates of pay? Um, should worker organizations be able to know about the uh, the relationships within supply chains so that they can you know organize and bargain more effectively? That gets us into, and this is an area that I have not quite cracked yet. Um, it gets us into a lot of questions of trade secrets. Uh, and you know whether that data and you know data slash information that's been gathered on work performance can actually end up being held privately by the company because they can legitimately claim trade secret protection for it. The answer, yes. the answer <laughs> that's my yes. <laughs> um, yes now I, right <laughs> now I don't have to do the research. Um, so. Uh, and then I guess like on your final point, yes, I do agree. Uh, it's a you know, process of alienation, absolutely. The one thing that I would add to that list and, uh, is rights of equal access uh, to the workplace and equal treatment in the workplace, right? So there's a, there are a bunch of discrimination type questions lurking here that I think is actually a fourth access from the distributional dignitary um, and uh, you know, the, the alienation concern. To circle back to where I started, the, I, the, one of the reasons I've started thinking about framing the project as a project about economic citizenship is because that strikes me, it seems to me a concept that can encapsulate all those different aspects of um, you know, the work relationship. Uh, it's kind of capacious enough to get them, but straightforward enough for people to maybe grasp intuitively. So um, you talked about um, making corporations responsible for their franchise partners or for the things that happen in franchises, for example. I wonder, isn't it difficult to construct it th that way that there's no, not like a double um, responsibility in some matters mm -hmm. regarding workplace re uh, violations, um, wages, um, work hours, and, and, and so forth? Uh, there is double responsibility quite often. Um, it doesn't trouble me that much, I guess. Uh, you know, firms, sophisticated firms in relationships like this can also put in indemnif indemnification clauses. Uh, they can allocate uh, responsibility um, for labor law violations. Uh, and this is actually, that's sort of the part of the proposal where the law has made the most progress already. Um, so in the Obama era, uh, the National Labor Relations Board was basically pursuing a theory that would have led to all McDonald's employees of, fr of franchisees being employees of McDonald's corporate. Um, that's still in progress, so the, the NLRB might actually still, you know, find for the employees, but I certainly think that the, you know, they're not pursuing the theory as aggressively as they could have before. Um, and the Obama era DOL, Department of Labor, uh, put out regulatory guidance that did, you know, took 
similar steps <coughs> with the uh, for wage and hour enforcement. Um, basically saying, you know, in many, many more instances, we're going to find joint employment relationships uh, or even, you know, sole employment where you have a contractual chain like that. Um, so anyway, like, it, it certainly is a risk. Uh, I think that the, um, it's one that's most easily managed when you're dealing with basic economic questions. Uh, so I think you would have to have different rules, for example, for wage and hour responsibility compared to, say, responsibility for violations of privacy uh, or for workplace harassment. Um, the doctrine, for what it's worth, does already reflect that to an extent. So, you know, what I'm proposing is kind of just an extension of what does seem to be developing. Thank you. For this was great. Papers, for the talk, for the Thank you very much.